right. So, hi, CSV Conf. It is so wonderful to be part of this, and Andrew and I are delighted to talk to you about this tricky little problem of uh, whether and when and how you close data that's been opened. So I am the open data librarian for the Washington State Library. Um, and very recently, it became part of my job to help curate and manage data.wa.gov, which is our state government open data portal. And you see a screenshot of, of it there on the right. Um, data.wa.gov is about a decade old. It's one of the more seasoned government data portals in the United States. And for most of that decade, the emphasis has understandably been on growth, um, getting more of our state agencies to uh, establish an open data plan, which they're all supposed to do, and um, identify public interest data and publish more of that data on the portal. And this has all happened in a very decentralized process. So the Office of the Chief Information Officer in Washington State provides the infrastructure, provides this open data platform and a little bit of support. But basically, it's left to the state agencies themselves to select the data and uh, prepare it and publish it and hopefully maintain it. And a lot about that decentralized process had worked really well. So here we are in 2020 and we have dozens of state agencies publishing hundreds of data sets on the portal and we've been talking to them and it looks like use is just going to accelerate. Um, if you can go to that portal and you can find wonderful public interest data on campaign contributions and consumer complaints to the Attorney General's office and salmon counts and other environmental data, and a lot of our agencies do a beautiful job of carefully choosing public interest, user-centered data, and preparing it and documenting it really well so that when it's published, it's, it's really usable. However, not all of the data falls into that category. So along with that beautifully prepared data, we also have a few data sets that are clearly identified as practice data sets, but they're still there. And we have a number of data sets that I think of as sort of like little jigsaw puzzle pieces. So it's a little bit of budget information for one agency in 2013, or it's some test results from one location in 2015, and it's never updated, and it doesn't look like anybody uses it after maybe the first month, and it's just sort of living there. And this makes the collection, the collection of data on the portal sort of noisy. And um, noise is a problem because noise makes it harder for the user to find what she wants. And it also just lowers confidence overall in the portal. We want people to go to the portal and have confidence that they're going to find something good there. So enter the library, the state library. So luckily for the state library and libraries generally, um, the person who for many years spearheaded open data in Washington state is Will Saunders. And um, Will um, has worked extensively with librarians and library staff over the years. And um, about a year and a half ago, he and OCIO started talking to the state library about a partnership where the library would provide some curation services for the data on the state portal. And this is doing some pretty straightforward library stuff with the collection of data there. So the idea was that the library would come in, it would help to prune some of the so-called low quality data, clean up the stuff that was rest that was left, um, like, you know, fill in the data dictionaries, maybe add some categories, make things a little easier to find, and generally support data quality and um, circulation and usability going forward. So State Library loved that. A partnership was forged. This is now half of my job. Um, but when we were getting started, we wanted to have a baseline assessment. So it was a good job for a summer internship. Um, we turned to the Open Data Literacy Project at the University of Washington, where I had been an intern when I was in library school. And ODL connected us, luckily, with Andrew, 
who came in to conduct this initial assessment. So we got Andrew all settled and uh, he dug in and started assessing the data, but very quickly as he was looking at the data and in talking with Will, they, they realized that there was a little hitch. And that is that there isn't actually really this clear path for retiring or removing data once it's been opened. So in a library, selection, adding content, or deselection, weeding content, happens um, and has a single basis, and that's the collection development policy. So ideally, a library has a policy that's written down, and it says, this is our community. Um, these are the needs that we believe our community has. And in order to meet those needs, we are going to collect these sorts of things. And we're not going to collect these sorts of things. And so as the library adds things or takes things away, there is this document that provides some clear, transparent criteria. And, and it's there to engender confidence and trust in the institution. But remember, data.wa.gov, like all of the government data portals that I'm aware of in the United States operates in a decentralized fashion. So the agencies themselves are the ones doing the selecting for a variety of reasons. And they're the ones who are publishing and maintaining the data. And technically, they can also just delete their data. So the screenshot you see there is my activity log when I log in as an administrator. And uh, owners, data owners, can just delete their assets. Now, effectively, they they don't just yank uh, data that the public's been using. Most of what's deleted is a draft or, or something that was never in the public eye. But there seemed to be a hole. Like, it didn't really seem to be in step with the spirit of open data, transparency, and accountability. And so Andrew and I talked about, like, let's look around and see if we can find some policies or procedures that would be a good foundation for something we could use in Washington State. So this is what we did. We decided we would look at other state government data portals, as many as we could find. And then we also looked at other domains that do selecting and weeding. Um, so besides libraries, that would be archives and depositories and scholarly repositories, museums, and that sort of thing. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Andrew and he's gonna tell you a little bit about what we found. Can you stop sharing your screen, mm -hmm. Kathleen? Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll pick up where Kathleen left off. And I think my screen is now being shared properly. Can everybody see that? Um, okay, I'm assuming everybody can see this. Uh, so we. Yep. Looking great. Uh, great, thanks. So we, we looked at all 50 states and we um, found 91 open um, government data sites. Um, 49 of which were geospatial sites, 13 were transparency sites that are um, mostly uh, uh, like figures about financial data or their meeting minutes. Um, 24 sites were uh, make tabular data available, like uh, data.wa.gov. Um, five were other open gov sites that didn't really fit in any of the other categories. We also sent 53 emails to contact links on um, a set of those sites. And we got 29 responses and we were asking about, do you have a data removal or retirement policy um, for your portal? So I assume many people have seen open government data portals, but just in case, this is one of them for Oklahoma. It's based on the DCAN software. You can see a list of data sets and descriptions, and then on the left, there's some facets um, to help someone browse. Um, same with data.wa.gov, it's on the Socrata platform. So these were the sites that Kathleen and I were looking at, and we were trying to uh, find contacts and find policies and procedures. So of those 91 sites, only six um, sites and six states had any type of policy that we could find. Um, and so five of those listed criteria for removal, and that's that little word cloud there, um, only replaced by new version was, that was in two policies, everything else, um, those are all unique. You can see mostly it's about um, whether 
data that was obsolete or it's been replaced, new version. Sometimes if there's an inaccuracy or it's private data. Five state, site, uh, states also had some type of procedure published um, about how to deal with remo uh, removing data sets. So four labeled retired data sets and three had a waiting period where a data set might get labeled and then 30 or some number of days later it would be uh, unpublished from the site. Now there is one really excellent example of a, a policy and procedure around removing open government data and that's on the New York City open data uh, portal which was out of our scope, the city portal, not the state portal, but it's um, it's a great example. So you can Google this, you can find it, uh, all those documentation is there. They have a data set that lists all the removed data sets and why they were removed. And there's this nice flow chart that describes what might happen to a data set. Maybe it's considered for archives, maybe it um, goes somewhere else. But a lot of state portals probably don't have the resources to implement this kind of thing. And so it's nice to know it's out there. Maybe there's some useful aspects of that that can be used in state portals. So we did find evidence of data sets being removed, retired, archived, um, both in our searching and through our correspondence with portal managers. Um, we heard from uh, a majority of pet portal managers mentioned that they've thought about this, that they're working on it, that they're interested in this. Um, some, some managers even mentioned, yeah, we've removed data before. Uh, on the screen, you see examples of data sets that have been less uh, labeled archived. And this is a great way to let a user know that maybe there's newer, better data available, especially if this archive version points to that new data. Um, but it has to be done well. It has to be well documented. Um, the lower right one, Beach's archive data, that is confusing. It could be an archive data set, or is it a data set of old Beach data that is maybe updated regularly? So it needs to be done with care. Um, and I should say, I personally had, uh, like, tried to find a data set I saw before and it, it was gone. Um, so I have a personal experience with this. So if a data set is removed, um, a user might want to contact the portal or figure out if they can get that data. And we noticed that portals um, can be very faceless. It can be very difficult to figure out who is behind it. Um, and so- Andrew, this is your five minute contact. warning. So okay. Got it. Um, and, uh, we have some examples here of, of our correspondence. So, um, you know, one portal had a, a data set owner who, who called themselves the Open Portal Kung Fu Master. It's kind of cool, but also uh, it's hard to tell who you're emailing there. And then uh, Kathleen got this really nice email and it was just signed Portal Administrator. So um, not all portals are like this though. Some portals have really great contacts and documentation information. It really kind of builds trust the user, if you're looking for something, you know where to go. This is Delaware, Maryland, and DC. And there are definitely other examples with great um, contact and documentation information. So like Kathleen mentioned, we looked at several domains for guidance on what to do with government data that uh, might be removed from the portal. Um, we considered archives. We talked to archivists. Um, we thought about retention schedules for government documents. Um, we looked at research data libraries and the data curation um, life cycle. And we also consider just public libraries. Can open government data just be weeded uh, like you would with a, a library collection? And we have, we've, we've settled on that it doesn't really fit in any one category, although any given uh, data set might, you know, it might be appropriate for the archive or might have some retention um, rules around it. But they seem to fit best, data sets seem to fit best um, between research data libraries and public libraries. So research data libraries have uh, really stringent appraisal and selection guidelines, and then there's a deaccessioning um, guidelines. It takes a lot of work, training to do that right. Data sets aren't necessarily updated all the time. Open government data, though, is all about being updated and current and relevant. Um, and so it didn't seem to fit quite right in that, that bucket. Public libraries, um, seems like a, a possibly good analogy, but when you read a book from a public library, a user or a patron can get that book elsewhere, interlibrary loan, publisher. Open government data set, though, might be the only copy. And so removing that um, might be more difficult for the, the um, user to find. Uh, archives are typically um, focused on data set or on, on records that are original, that um, need to be preserved for long term. Um, some open data may 
fall under that umbrella. Um, same with record retention. It's mostly focused on uh, like records or maybe some types of publications. Um, but open data, again, is just a copy. Uh, open government data is a copy of data that's sitting somewhere in a state agency. And so um, most likely archives and record retention rules would apply to, to the data, the original data, not necessarily the open um, government data version. So with that, I'm just going to, um, I'll keep transitioning slides, but Kathleen's going to talk about what this means for data.wa.gov. Right. So I'm continuing to be the curator. And as the curator, OK, so I don't order people around, but I make recommendations to OCIO and to our open data advisory group. So yeah, going to recommend that um, we have a written data retirement policy, identify some of those criteria that we found elsewhere, have a clear procedure, some notice so that we don't, you know, yank some data that a, somebody was using. Um, and then have some clear labeling um, to make a record of what's been removed and why. Um, also good to kind of go back to the beginning and raise the conversation about selection. Again, this is a decentralized environment. We're not gonna take that away from agencies, but it's great to have this conversation in that spirit of collection development, which is just who's our community, who are our users, why do we publish open data, what are we trying to do? So it's good. Publishing open data is a lot of work. It's good to have these touchstones that um, help us to remember why we're doing it. Um, of course, we were talking about lower quality data that we want to remove, but thinking about that whole continuum, it's a great reminder to, you know, at the 10 year mark, talk to our wonderful digital archives in Washington State about long term preservation and historic value. And finally, um, we don't want to be one of those faceless. Um, data portals. We want humans on data.wa.gov. Humans are on data.wa.gov. If anything has come up in the past couple of days, we've heard these wonderful presentations reminding us that data is not this anonymous, antiseptic, neutral, magic thing. It is a human endeavor um, with lots of human work and human ideas and goals and interests and values. And we do a service to the public by reminding them um, of that. And we can do it really easily by just having my name on the portal for help and also some who we are documentation. So that's where we're going. That's what we found. And we're happy to answer any questions if we have time. Thank you very much both. That was really fantastic. We have got time for a very quick question. And it's a question from Sarah and it says, how has this research influenced your approach to curating Washington's open data platform? <laughs> well, um, so certainly the recommendations that, um, that we just talked about. And um, I think that it's also helped me to focus on how we're going to do this in a collaborative way, um, working with uh, our publishers, um, many of whom, as I said, are have been laboring in the vineyard and doing just wonderful user-centered work. And so it's a great opportunity. You know, it's what librarians do. We circulate, you know, we find things and make exhibits and we promote really good quality material. And we have plenty of that. So it's it's nice to be in a position to raise their profile. Brilliant. Okay, so we're exactly on time. So Andrew, Kathleen, thank you very much for that. And thank you to Erica and Andres as well. Um, it was another fantastic session and uh, we have one more session for the, for the day, uh, I believe, uh, which will be followed by a drinks Zoom session. So if everybody would like to jump to those things, thank you all for coming.